we're on. You're good, Bruce. Okay, this is uh, round. Which, what's the number of the round table? 41. No, no, the it's round table. Oh, 41. Uh, it's yeah, 91. 91. Okay. Uh, welcome to Interpreter Roundtable number 91. We're doing the Old Testament, lesson number 41. I have made thee this day an iron pillar. Uh, we have left to right here, well, depending on what you can see, Daniel Peterson, Ben McGuire, Mike Parker, I'm Bruce Webster. And uh, we'll start off here with some background from uh, Mike with Ben chiming in. Take it away. Can everybody hear me? I have having technical yep. issues earlier. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, this is the first time in the in the lesson material that I'm, I think that we've actually gotten into uh, the Babylonians as the big bad. Um, up to this point, the Assyrians have, have been uh, the problem, and, and particularly working its way through Isaiah and, and so forth. Uh, now we get to Jeremiah, and, and some things happened in between uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah's time, and, and the, the, the big earth-shattering thing that took place is that the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, overthrew them, and, and took over their kingdom in 612 B.C. And there was a major power vacuum in the region at that point, and Egypt and Judah decided to take advantage of it by asserting their independence. And the Babylonians put down those rebellions in 605 and, and in 602, and so Judah, uh, which was the only remaining kingdom because the northern kingdom of Israel was gone, and it had been gone for over 100 years at this point. Uh, Judah was still under the Babylonians' thumb now instead of being under the Assyrians. Um, the people of Judah decided to rebel again, and this was in about 598, 597. And at that point, the Babylonians decided to besiege Jerusalem. They plundered the temple. They deported many of the elite and skilled Jews to Babylon. Uh, and the Babylonians installed Zedekiah as the king of Judah um, and, and as their puppet ruler. Um, now, we're familiar with Zedekiah as Latter-day Saints, of course, because he figures into those early chapters in the Book of Mormon where Nephi talks about uh, his father, Lehi, receiving his calling and, uh, and, and first visions uh, during the reign of, of Zedekiah. So Nephi and his family had not been deported. They were some of the ones who, were, had, been, who had managed to stay behind. Um, Lehi and many other prophets at this time, they preached repentance to Judah. Uh, but the people mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets. We learn from Second Chronicles 36. Uh, in First Nephi chapter 1, it talks about how the people tried to kill his father, Lehi. And the people of Judah rebelled a third time, and this was in 589. Lehi and his family had already left by that point. But after another siege that lasted 18 months, the Babylonians destroyed the temple and deported most of the remaining Jews to Babylon. A handful of Jews remained in Jerusalem. Some of them escaped to Egypt, and Jeremiah is one of those ones who remained and was taken against his will to, uh, to Egypt. And so this is where the, the Babylonian captivity of, of the Jewish people begins that, that lasts until the time of Ezra and, and Nehemiah and so forth. So in upcoming lessons, uh, we'll learn about Ezekiel, who actually prophesies from Babylon and, and, and so forth. So. Jeremiah's ministry takes place during this very tumultuous time, and he witnessed firsthand the decline and fall of his people. And his, his book is really a testimony, uh, a witness against the wickedness of not only his own people, but also the foreign nations that are around him. So just very briefly, who is Jeremiah? Well, he's the son of a priest of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. And so he lived just two or three miles north of Jerusalem. He was called as a prophet at age 13, and began his ministry at age 19, and this was in the year of King Josiah. Um, and this puts him in a class of prophets called at a very young age, including Samuel, uh, the prophet Mormon, and Joseph Smith, and so forth. Um, his ministry lasted 40 years, and it ended when he and his scribe were taken to Egypt. His scribe's name is Baruch. Um, many of his oracles involved metaphor. And the Lord uh, would, for example, command Jeremiah to look at or to do something, and then the Lord would compare his relationship to Israel with that thing. And I, I wanted to give you one example of this. Uh, this is in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Uh, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? He, the Lord has given him a vision. And Jeremiah answers, and he says, I see a rod of an almond tree, in other words, a branch of an almond tree. 
Then the Lord said unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Another word for hasten, probably better translation would be, I am watching over my word to perform it. In other words, I'm going to make certain that everything that I say gets done. Well, in, you read this in English and you go, what in the world does the branch of an almond tree have to do with uh, the, 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 word, or the Lord watching over his word? Well, there's a, there's a pun, a wordplay going on in Hebrew here. The word for almond tree in Hebrew is shaked, and the word for watching over or hasten in Hebrew is shoked. They're very, very similar. So this would be kind of like if President Monson got up in general conference and said that he's had a vision, and in his vision he saw Luke Skywalker, and he asked the Lord what the v meaning of the vision was. And, and the Lord says, I am looking out for the church. <laughs> okay. Now, you, I mean, that is a really horrible, awful pun, but that's kind of on the level that, <laughs> that we're talking about here. This kind of stuff, it works really well in Hebrew. It does not work well in English. We, we, you know, puns, people tend to groan. And in Hebrew, those people would read that and they would go, oh, that's very clever. I see exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of the level that, that Jeremiah is operating on in in, uh, in many of his, his revelations. So that's a brief introduction to Jeremiah. Ben, I think you wanted to add some things. Well, you know, just from the, the beginning, uh, and to point out something you said, Jeremiah is kind of a unique in, individual in terms of prophets. Isaiah has all these prof prophecies of a future that for the most part he never sees. Um, Jeremiah gives his prophecy, and, and then he gets to spend 40 years saying, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it surprises us that they drag him off to Egypt um, in some ways. Um, the book of Jeremiah is uh, was heavily edited at some point after Jeremiah's ministry. And uh, this does a couple of interesting things for us as we read it, because and I don't think we'll probably get into this much over these next couple lessons, but um, um, Jeremiah the, the prophet uh, in his writings was much more similar to, to say, Lehi, I think, uh, in, in Lehi's teachings in the Book of Mormon. Uh, the later editor who comes after all this has happened and his, is cleaning it up is very much in favor of the current uh, state of the church in, in Judea. Um, and uh, tends to put a much more favorable spin on a lot of the things that Jeremiah is very critical of. Uh, the other interesting thing that I think, uh, and, and Mike I kind of points this a little bit, is just that um, this is the kind of the common language of the time period uh, and the religious experience, and it's an experience. You see things, you get shown things, uh, you then interpret them. It, uh, we see this over and over again also in the Book of Mormon, right, with Lehi and his vision of the Tree of Life and, and Nephi. Uh, they see something and then the, they, they ask their, their guide or their messenger, what does this mean? And that gets explained to them sometimes, right? Um, and, but one of the interesting things about these kinds of revelations is, is that as you experience them, you experience them uh, in a way that is, for the most part, unique to you. You can explain it to other people, um, but for them to really appreciate it, often they have to experience it themselves. Um, and uh, and that's kind of one of the lessons that we learn early on in the Book of Mormon, is that, that encouragement to do that. Um, and if you're not willing to, of course, this is part of the reason, perhaps, that uh, many of the Israelites had no interest in Jeremiah's message at the time. Um, and uh, in terms of that, uh, the other thing we have to remember when we're going through Jeremiah, and this is true both of uh, the original text and some of the later editing, this destruction is one of the most uh, significant events that occurs for all of Israelite history, right? This is the beginning of the, the, um, the period when they've lost their country, uh, the, the Babylonian captivity, uh, and much of the rest of Scripture is is built around this theme, this idea. Um, and we have a number of psalms that are s produced to memorialize this event, to the suffering and the angst that they feel, not individually, but as an entire community, um, as they feel that their their whole culture is being taken away from them, and uh, the memory of their past and their 
their religious observances, the temple is gone, uh, everything that was the center of, of their identity has been stripped from them, uh, and all that they have are these promises of a restoration, and so these passages in Jeremiah, and we'll touch on some of them today, that deal with this restoration, uh, here in Jeremiah they come from a completely different point of view uh, than what we see in Isaiah. Uh, this is this is the point of view of an absolute loss and suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay can I uh, follow up on that really quickly? Um, it, uh, ben is absolutely right. Uh, Jeremiah's writings are, are were not uh, compiled by him. Very unlikely to have been compiled by him. They were compiled out of chronological order. So the the book itself has a very difficult structure. It's really hard to tell what order it comes in, and some people have tried to put it back in, in the chronological order, and, and the best we can do is guess on that. Uh, we do know that some of Jeremiah's writings were on the brass plates that Nephi took from Laban. It mentions that in 1 Nephi 5.13. So we know that during Jeremiah's lifetime, at least some of his prophecies, whatever they were, were being considered authoritative or, or were accepted by, by some individuals. Um, uh, but the Book of Mormon doesn't actually quote from Jeremiah. We, he, it mentions him three times, but it doesn't actually tell us anything that he said. So uh, at, at whatever least, was on the breastplates, it must have been few. At, at least, least not that we recognize. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's also traditionally considered to be the author of Lamentations, which is why Lamentations follows Jeremiah, although that's extremely unlikely because the chapters in Lamentations all have very different themes, very different wording. Uh, they seem to uh, have been written by separate individuals and then later put together. He's also uh, traditionally considered to be the author of the book of First and Second Kings, uh, which is also, again, highly unlikely. But um, that's kind of where the... We lost you there, Mike, right at the end. Can Hello? you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yeah, you can hear you now. We just lost your last few words of that comment. You oh. said about First and Second Chronicles, or, or First and Second Kings. Oh, First and Second Kings. Excuse me. That Jeremiah is traditionally yeah. considered the author of First and Second Kings, although again, that is also extremely unlikely. Um, but it is that that is the tradition. Okay. Let's talk about uh, chapters one and two with his calling. Uh, Mike, you made some references there and some of the parallels. <laughs> Uh, plus, you have one of the, the classic things that we as Latter-day Saints like to quote uh, in terms of a pre-existence, and that actually, from what I've seen, other other Christian Bible commentators sort of have to deal with, as well as some Jewish ones, uh, where he says in verse uh, 5, you know, before I created you, I selected you before you, I created you in the womb, and so on. Thoughts on, on Jeremiah's call as a prophet? Who wants to jump in? Well, I, I don't know if we mentioned specifically that he's uh, he's far and away not the only prophet in this time period, it being a time of, of yeah. turbulence and strife. Uh, Zephaniah was probably just a little bit before his time, and uh, contemporary to him, uh, 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 it may be that you have Obadiah and Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, and, and then late, a late contemporary is Ezekiel, who's off in exile. So there's a lot of prophesying going on. Lehi fits fairly nicely into that. Uh, yeah. In the sense that there are just a lot of people crying out warnings and uh, and and so on during this really pivotal time in, in the history of Israel. Um, so uh, another thing that needs to be noted is that he's uh, he's both a prophet and a priest. There are sometimes um, there's a tendency. There certainly was a tendency in in uh, sociologists like Max Weber to argue that you know you have two archetypes: the the prophet and the priest, and they're really opposed. Well, in in this case. Uh, Jeremiah is both prophet and priest. He's from a priestly family, and that's probably why he lives uh, fairly close to Jerusalem, because the family is is a priestly family, and they're involved with the uh, with the liturgy, the rituals of the temple. Uh, whether Jeremiah was himself, I don't know. At one point later on, he goes to, goes on to send Baruch into the temple to preach because. Uh, he's restricted from going in. Apparently, he's become persona non grata. He's lost his recommend, um, or whatever. Um, he just isn't allowed in. So, um, uh, but he he combines both the priestly and the prophetic uh, roles or or background heritage here. Um, any other comments? Ben, Mike. Um, it's just 
and and going back to chapter one there, right? Uh, verse six, uh, and he's he's receiving his call, and he says, "Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child." It's it's uh, similar to that classic excuse, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and really, it's meant to evoke uh, uh, some of the things like Moses and Enoch. Uh, yeah. And, yes. All of these guys who have trouble expressing uh, this language and are worried about being able to prophesy appropriately. Um, and uh, he goes through, it's kind of almost the, the classic formula in some ways. Uh, the Lord says, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, uh, saith the Lord. And then uh, uh, the Lord puts the words in, into his mouth. Yeah. Can I comment on that, too? The uh, the idea of be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. This contrasts really directly uh, in, I think, the very last chapter in this lesson, which is chapter 38, where Zedekiah fails to uh, to act. Jeremiah tells him what to do if he wants to preserve his life, and Zedekiah basically says, I'm afraid of the people here, you know, they might they might do me in. When um, when the when some of the officers, some of the officials, high ranking aristocracy or whatever come to him and want to want to arrest uh, Jeremiah, Zedekiah says, oh, I can't do anything about it. He's the king, but he's afraid of the people. Jeremiah is being told, Don't be afraid of the people, I'll be with you, I'll protect you. Uh, Zedekiah is offered protection if he will obey the prophet Jeremiah, but he he won't take that step. And so he um, Forfeits his family and and his kingdom because uh, he would not do what the prophet told him to do. He would not trust in the Lord. So it's it's very different. This is a message that Jeremiah is starting off with in chapter one, and and at the end of our lessons, the same message: trust the Lord; He'll take care of you. Or try to defend yourself, and it may turn out to be a disaster. The uh, actually your your the comment that was made just a minute ago about. Uh, him giving the classic, you know, I'm, I'm. He doesn't say I'm slow of speech, but he says I, I don't know how to speak. Uh, I think if I were a prophet coming, a, you know, how many, sixty years, eighty years after Isaiah, I might feel intimidated too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at least the the text here gives a uh, a uh, uh, Ascension or introduction to the Lord's presence motif that directly parallels Isaiah 6, uh, where it, in Isaiah 6 it's the angel who brings the coal and touches Isaiah's lips uh, to purify his mouth, and here the Lord puts out his hand and touches his mouth uh, and signals that he's, you know, he is to open his mouth and, and speak the words the Lord gives him. Then you were going to. Well, let, let's not forget, as, as Mike pointed out, right? Um, he really is a child in, in yeah. some ways, right? He's yeah. very young when this happens. Yeah. Uh, um, most of us can probably remember what we were doing to some extent in our young teens. Well, maybe not Dan. <laughs> uh, there are cuneiform tablets, though, that tell a lot about what I was up to. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, but uh, uh, becoming a prophet was probably not high on our list of, of objectives and goals at that point in our life. <laughs> and, and and you've got the parallels there with Joseph Smith, uh, yeah. who has who has the first vision, uh, and then for three years just sort of goes about doing his other stuff, and uh, uh, but is feeling bad, and then Moroni comes and kickstarts everything again. But you know, it's it's not surprising that he feels inadequate. Who wouldn't yeah. given this kind of a calling? I mean, uh, it's one thing to look up to other prophets, but then you realize you're it. It's it's now your job. I remember just on a much lower level the the day that I was set apart, ordained as a bishop, and I I thought, you know, all my life I've looked up to bishops, and now I now am, I am one. one. I mean, I me. <laughs> Uh, so how much how much greater a challenge to be called as the Lord's mouthpiece in this in this case? Let's let's jump to chapter twenty, which uh, at Actually, least if we, oh Mike yes can, can, we, can we back up for just a second because we, yeah. we we breezed right over verses four and five. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I think that's easy to do because as Latter Day Saints we're really familiar with those verses. <laughs> um, uh, and I I just wanted to say a couple of things really quickly. First of all, uh, there are some 
doctrines that are, are either Christian doctrines in general or Latter-day Saint doctrines in particular that are simply not found at all in the Old Testament. Um, and and this, this is one of them, uh, the idea of a pre-mortal existence. There are just simply a couple of hints here and there, but there is no explanation of the doctrine. You know, as Latter-day Saints, we take it for granted because we have uh, the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham, which introduce that into that ancient context. And then, of course, we have modern revelation that talks about it. Uh, but Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 is the strongest passage supporting that. And even that is, you, you could th technically read it a couple of different ways. Um, but, but it's an important one. Um, and what's really interesting about it is not only does it say that God knew Jeremiah before he was born, but that he also set him apart. Yeah. Uh, King James uses the word sanctified, and that's what it means. I'm going to take this thing here, and I'm going to put it over here, um, and ordained him to be a prophet. And this is backed up by the Book of Mormon in Alma chapter 13, um, where it teaches that all those that hold the priesthood in this life were called and prepared from the foundation of the world. Uh, and Joseph Smith says the same thing, that every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the Grand Council before the world was. I suppose that I was ordained to this very office in that Grand Council. So th this is really uh, the, the central passage as far as pre-mortal life goes outside of modern revelation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really about it for the entire Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Well, you've got the one uh, reference with Christ's healing of the of the man who says, "Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind?" That would be the yeah. other classic yeah. piece, I suppose. Oh. Okay, so Jeremiah may have been why <laughs> had good reason to be uh, anxious about this calling because it brings him a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, there's there there. Again, I'm I'm struck with parallels uh, with Abinadi, with Joseph Smith, and so on, in just some of the things he goes through. If we go to chapter 20, the first six verses, someone want to talk about those? That's this this is this is where Pasher, the chief governor of the temple, basically yeah. has Jeremiah beaten. It's it's a bit like what Paul goes through. Yeah. Uh, you know, stop preaching this. We're going to beat you, uh, put you in the stocks for a while, and then release you. Uh, and uh, Jeremiah, again, kind of like uh, Paul before the Sanhedrin, though, though Jeremiah doesn't repent of it, says, you know, all right, you beat me. Guess what? <laughs> Awful things are going to happen because you're not listening to what I'm saying. Comments? Well, it's you know Jeremiah is is often regarded as the prophet of doom, and it's it's really just about all negative. He doesn't have a lot of bright things, happy things to talk about. It's it's destruction and woe that's coming. So, you know, in in one respect, this is his typical message. Only he personalizes it for this guy. Is you know because you've done this, um, you're you're going to be uh, it's just going to be a disaster for you. And yet Jeremiah himself is not. Is not happy about this. I mean, you, you read what he has to say while we're in uh, chapter 20. He goes on to complain to the Lord. He didn't want this mission. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> Lord, why'd you call me? I, you know, you're stronger than I am. You prevailed. But I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. I hate this job. Yeah. I, I hate my calling. You know, I don't want to be doing this. And to where at the end of the chapter, cursed be the day wherein I was born, you know, I just wish I didn't even exist. This is so unpleasant to be always the voice of doom to my people. Everyone hates me, no one's happy, and my message isn't a happy one anyway. So it's it's a pretty depressing calling to have. Um, and and as, as Mike pointed out earlier, it's 40 years of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what's really interesting about this is if you look at verses 7 through 9 in chapter 20, um, where he complains about this, and, he, and he, he says, Lord, you've deceived me. Now, the word deceived there could be translated a couple of different ways. Um, enticed or coerced might yeah. be a, a better way of putting it. In other words, you, you, you kind of, I, I ended up doing this against my will. You've overpowered me, yeah. and now I'm in derision. I'm a laughing stock. And um, he says in verse 8, uh, every time I cry out violence, destruction, um, that the word of the Lord is a, is a reproach, it's a derision. I mean, people just mock me, all, you know, endlessly. And then that beautiful passage in verse 9, And so I said, 
I am, you know, I'm not going to mention the Lord. I'm not going to speak his name. I'm just going to be completely quiet. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire to shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing. In other words, I was, I was so tired of holding it in. Yeah. And it's this very interesting contrast where on the one hand, you, you don't want to prophesy. You don't want to have this calling. You don't want to have this job. But on the other hand, you are so overcome with the spirit that you can't not yeah. say something. I, I've seen one translation of this is not you've deceived me or you've lied to me, but you've seduced me. You know, you lured me yeah. into this. You kind of, but I didn't want to do it. And I, I think Isaiah, or excuse me, Jeremiah is a classic case of someone who is not in this for the money. He is not in it because of the glory. He's not in it because it's a wish fulfillment fantasy for him. He'd rather not, but he can't not. Um, and so there you have it. And this this is kind of the great tragedy of this story, right? Because had people done what he asked, yeah, things would have been better, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and instead, he he knows what's going to happen. It's going to be even worse. <clears throat> and even though he ends up knowing that he was right, and everybody realizes that he was a real prophet and prophesying the truth, it is a tragedy in the end. Yeah. yeah. Then we jump ahead in the lesson here to 26, 7 through 15, and we well, have a... We oh. skipped two, didn't we? Well, let's see. What do you want to... Well, there, there were a couple of things I just wanted to point out and, about And two. point out, point out. If, um, there's just a couple of images that I really love. I love uh, verse 13 where uh, he says, My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. This yeah. is the Lord speaking. Um, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they've compounded their sin. They've they've um, they've given up on God, and they've created their own uh, false gods who can't give them anything. They're they're cisterns, broken cisterns. You know, they plaster cisterns there, and if the plaster uh, breaks or cracks, then the water simply leaks out into the surrounding soil, and you end up with a cistern that. It's fine, but there's nothing in it, nothing to sustain life, and uh, so that's what they've done. And then picking up that uh, that theme of of uh, uh, opposing idolatry in verses 27 and 28, um, he he talks about the the princes and the priests and their prophets who are saying to a stock, you know, to a piece of wood, "Thou art my father," and to a stone, "Thou hast brought me forth." For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. But where are thy gods? This is what he'll say to them then. Where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. You know, every town has its own god. You've manufactured these things out of rock and out of wood. And, uh, and, and yet when the trouble comes upon you, you'll appeal to them in vain. Then you'll want me to help out. But you, now you're ignoring me. So... It's a powerful polemic against idolatry. There's some very beautiful imagery in that earlier passage that you that you brought up, Dan, where he he contrasts the Lord as the fountain of living waters yeah. versus these broken cisterns. A, a fountain of living waters is if you've ever been up hiking into the mountains and you see this fresh spring that's just coming right out of the rock and you drink out of it and it's cold and clear and crisp and it, I mean it's just the most refreshing water you've ever had. Compare that to a cistern. Now, a cistern, for those of you who are not familiar, are, it's just a hole that you've dug in the ground, and you collect yeah. rainwater in it. And it's going to be filthy. It's going to be mucky. And not yeah. only that, but it's broken, and all the water's leaked out. And so all you've got is just this 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 collection of probably filthy, um, mossy, dirty, muddy water at the bottom. What a contrast! What a yeah. what a just an amazing image. And of course, the Savior. In the New Testament, picks up on that. It talks about him. He is the fountain of living waters, and and so forth. That all the all the truth and light and so forth come from him. Later on, uh, uh, Jeremiah is actually cast into a cistern briefly, and it's one that's apparently broken. All the water is leaked out, and there's just mud at the bottom. He's kind of mired in this muck. That's what you get with a broken cistern. So, at the but at the at the best, it's not very good. In ancient times, uh, some of the sects required that baptism be performed in living water. That meant you know, not not stagnant, mucky water, but water that was moving, that was fresh. Anyway, that's ben, all I wanted to pick up on, I think. No, that's great. Ben, any comments? 
just um, in that chapter two, I also love that imagery in verses 34 and 35. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. He's saying your guilt is visible everywhere. It, it's dripping off you. And then the, the people say in verse 35, Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Uh, the, the rejection of the message, they're saying that we've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. There's nothing for us to repent of. And yet the Lord is saying, I see it just looking at you. The, you know, the, the, the blood guilt is just dripping off you. Uh, how can you say you're innocent? Well, it's like Laman and Lemuel who say, yeah, people back in Jerusalem are righteous people. What's the problem? No. They well, thought they were. And you have, to, you have Jacob pick up that imagery in his, in his talk at the temple, basically saying, I'm holding my garments before you. They are clean of your blood. Yeah. This is upon you. Uh, because he's concerned they're going in the same, basically the same direction that they they left back there. Uh, the uh, 26, 7 through 15 is what the, the lesson quotes. This reminded me a lot of Abinadi before Noah and his priests, as do some of the other ones, because uh, you have the people crowding around Jeremiah at the temple and being very upset at what he's preaching and saying, this man deserves to die. Uh... Thoughts, thoughts, comments, who wants to go through that? Well, they're very upset with him because he's so negative. Verse 9, Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? You know, how dare you? So this is treason. This is, and he's accused at various points in the book of Jeremiah. of uh, he's, he's not doing much to buck up the morale of the people. I mean, they, want to, they want somebody who will speak comfortably speak, as Elder Holland quoted in conference uh, six months ago, uh, speak smooth things to us. We want happy things. Tell us how good we are and how great things are. And uh, that's certainly not and, Jeremiah. Uh, as, as kind of a reminder for, for those of you who are watching, right, Shiloh was the, the cultic center of Israel, the, the northern kingdom, uh, that has just been wiped off the earth, right, a uh, hundred or so years earlier. He's essentially telling him that uh, you're going to be just like is uh, Israel. You're going to be, you're going to be dominated by these invaders, and they're, it isn't going to matter that this is your holy city and this is where God is. It, it's going to go. Yeah, you know, and, and we've said that there were other prophets, um, you know, prophesying at or about this time, Ezekiel and Zephaniah and Obadiah and Habakkuk, and uh, and there's a reference later on in this chapter to another prophet, Uriah, or yeah. Urijah, however you want to pronounce it in English, uh, who actually was killed. I mean, this is another prophet of whom we know essentially nothing, but uh, but he was done in for the message he delivered. This is yeah. serious business. And he's, he's not only done. Well. He's not only done in. He actually flees to Egypt. Yeah. And the king sends people down and drags him back, has him killed and thrown in the common, the grave yeah. of the common people, uh, which which you know, I I think a lot of what we get from reading what Jeremiah goes through and hear what uh, Uriah goes through, uh, I think Lehi uh, had no problem leaving Jerusalem very promptly because <laughs> he, he knew he knew what uh, was waiting for him. In fact, we'll, we'll read that even after Zedekiah takes over, in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, what happens? Jeremiah is arrested and thrown into prison. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Lehi, you know, was like, you know, I'm out of here. Uh, and not, not only does he leave Jerusalem, he heads at a right angle away from both Egypt coming up from the south, if they do come, and Babylon coming down from the north. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's putting, he's, he's, not, he's not in the path of anyone who's coming towards there, and he's, he's getting away as fast as he can. There, uh, there seems to have been, as part of the treaty uh, between Egypt and, and uh, Judah at this period, there may have been a mutual extradition agreement, so that... Uh, you know, going to Egypt, it turns out, wouldn't actually be safe if the king decided he wanted to come after you. So, so Lehi doesn't go to Egypt. Um, he certainly doesn't go north. He heads kind of between them. It's uh, it's racing between the closing doors. They're coming together to destroy uh, Judah, but he yeah. gets out by going between them. And Jeremiah here in 26 still, 
is is pretty bold. He basically says, uh, you know, they're calling for his death, and he says, mend your ways and your acts, and heed the Lord your God, that the Lord may renounce the punishment he has decreed for you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do to me what seemeth good and right to you. But know that if you put me to death, you and this city and its inhabitants will guilty, be guilty of shedding the blood of an innocent man. Uh, this, this again, is very striking, very much like Abinadi before Noah and his mm -hmm. priests, saying, you know, if I die, I die, but uh, this is going to be upon your heads. Yeah. Any other thoughts here with 26? Well, one of the frustrating things about this is there's so much that could be said about yeah. each of these chapters, you know, but we just don't have the time to do it, and there won't be time in a gospel doctrine class to do it <laughs> just either, but we can pick up some highlights here and there. Yeah. But, yeah, and just that point about the innocence, right, goes back to that, that bit in Chapter 2 that we just talked about. Uh, they're claiming that they're innocent, and, yeah. and, uh, and he's pointing out that if you killed prophets... That kind of, you know, it, it, apparently they think it doesn't count, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And 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 again, that's a pattern we see in the Book of Mormon. You know, this man revileth against us and against our laws and against our priests. What have we done? We're innocent. Yeah. Why does why does he think? You know, why do they think? Why do they revile against us? It's. Uh, it's it's yet another standard pattern of disbelief and uh, apostasy. Yeah. Uh, it, it, might, oh, go it ahead. might be worth mentioning too, although we probably don't have time to go into it, is this is this attitude towards the prophets is one of the things that, that they have found in contemporary texts that they've unearthed there um, in some of the tablets, right? Um, this This idea that we have this the, the political establishment was very worried about uh, these prophets who were undermining their authority mm -hmm. uh, and might actually convince the people that what they were doing in their alliance with Egypt might not be the best thing for them. Yeah. Okay, anything more on, on 26? If, if not, we can jump to 36 and a great story about... Uh, uh, that's already been alluded to about uh, Jeremiah not not having his temple recommend revoked in Dan's <laughs> words, <laughs> and so he he has his scribe Baruch write down his words, and Baruch Baruch is is a brave man because he goes and reads the words, <laughs> uh, and then hands the scroll over and leaves, and apparently wisely so because uh, it doesn't get a great reception. Anyone want to talk about the the whole story with the scroll and? Uh, uh, the king's reaction to it. Well, the idea that, that Jeremiah can dictate all this is pretty impressive. Uh, decides to dictate all the prophecies he's received and, and have them written down by Baruch the scribe. And then when it's destroyed, he does it again. And, uh, and then to rub salt into the wound, he adds additional <laughs> words like the ones that, uh, that had already been given. Oh, yeah, you didn't like my message? Well, here it is again, and then some. Yes, um, <laughs> and, so. and by the way, your your body, your dead body, is going to be left out in the open. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and again, you've got an Abinadi parallel there, where you know he basically says, "Hey, you know what you do to me is going to happen to you, King Noah." Uh, yeah. The, uh, but it's a striking image of the king as as a scroll is being read to him, cutting off the leaves and throwing them in the fire until they're all burned. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> and he actually tries to to arrest Jeremiah and Baruch at that time, but they flee. Other thoughts and comments, observations on specific passages here. You know, it says that it's in the the winter. I can't remember how the King James renders it. He's in the winter room of the winter palace. It's presumably this is uh, this is sometime around 604 uh, BC, probably in December. And uh, Jerusalem can get cold around that time of the year, so we've got a fire going. When it it uh, describes it as a fire pot, I think. Um, if I'm not mistaken. There's a fire on the hearth burning before him. Yeah. Probably a fire in the center of the room that's just there to warm the warm the room because if you're in these little places, uh, Jerusalem's fairly high, about 2,500 feet above sea level, and it it can get a cool wind in December that time of the year a little later it's even been known to get snow 
And so you're in these places without insulation, without uh, without any of those modern conveniences. And so there's a fire convenient, ready to hand when it's time for the king to destroy this scroll. And he thinks that he can, you know, by destroying the scroll, he's ending Jeremiah's prophecy. The irony is that, of course, Jeremiah can just dictate it again and then add more. Well, and, and you know, he reads three or four parts of it, right? Mm -hmm. The first couple columns, and that's when he shreds it and throws it in the fire. Yeah. He's, he's had enough. Yeah. Right? I don't need to read it anymore. It's all going to be like this, and, and off it goes. Yeah. And, you know, it always is that, you know, if you just, if you burn the document or you burn the guy, that's that's the end of it. But, it you know, ideas like this don't die. I mean, you can even see this in a way later on. I'm just thinking aloud in the, you know, the times when the, when some of the Bible translators are actually burned at the stake, you know, as if you can just end this, the coming of the scriptures and so on. But they, they're just somebody else who starts uh, writing them down again, translating them again. And so it, it doesn't work can't ultimately suppress this kind of dissent. Okay. Other comments? Mike, do you have anything? I don't. Uh, 37 is we have a change in kings. As, as, as Mike, I believe you talked about at the start. This is when... I uh, uh, want to make sure I don't mangle Jeho... <laughs> when when uh, Jehoiakim gets deposed yeah. by Babylon... And Zedekiah is installed as, as as a puppet. So now we're in the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah. Uh, a phrase that all of us as Mormons just resonates with us. <laughs> 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 having, having read First Nephi chapter one innumerable times as members of the church. Uh, well, this is the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah, uh, and uh, he's actually asking Jeremiah for help and saying, "Please pray on our behalf." Yeah. Uh, someone want to comment on, dive in here and talk about this chapter? Well, one of the things that they're doing, Zedekiah and, and others, have been hoping that against the, the rising menace of this, uh, <coughs> these powers in Mesopotamia, now the Babylonians, they're invoking the aid of Egypt. And, um, you know, and they have reason to do it. I mean, in terms of a secular political gambit, it was, it was, it was reasonably, it was uh, reasonably plausible. Egypt had been around for, you know, by this point, the, the Great Pyramid is 2,100, 2,200 years old. Nobody really knows exactly, but around there. It's over 2,000 years old. Egypt has been there forever, and it's gone through some vicissitudes. You've had the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom. You're now late in the New Kingdom. Um, but it's the other great power of the day, and so you play a power political uh, uh, game here. You ally yourself with the other great power against the one that's threatening you. And... Uh, there was some cultural sympathy, maybe, uh, in some ways. I mean, the very fact that Lehi, for example, teaches, has Egyptian taught to his son Nephi indicates that there's an Egyptian presence, uh, intellectual prestige, whatever it may be. But Jeremiah's message is, they're not going to help you. Don't rely on Egypt, which he describes elsewhere as a weak reed, that if you lean on, lean on it, it'll pierce your hand. Yeah. Uh, and who can imagine? I mean, we're, to me, it was a great shock when the Soviet Union collapsed. Right? It had been there for when it finally collapsed, I don't know, 70 years or something like that. Egypt had been there pretty much in stable form for 2,000 years and more. So it, it was natural to assume they'd be there forever. But Egypt's days as an independent power are just about over. Egypt is a shadow of its former self. So, so Jeremiah says, uh, you know, Pharaoh's army is coming forth out of Egypt and... Uh, and uh, the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, so they departed from Jerusalem. Looks like the thing is succeeding. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah in verse 6, uh, saying, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. In other words, they're going to retreat. They're going to hightail it back to the Nile Valley. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against the city, and take it and burn it with fire. Thus saith the Lord, Deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remained but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn the city with fire. And there's nothing <laughs> you can do on a, on a secular, you know, strategic level. You are doomed. 
I'm your only hope, and you're not paying attention to me. So the uh, and and you have the, the following that you've got Jeremiah. Once the siege is lifted temporarily, uh, he's going to head to the uh, to the property or the area of Benjamin, uh, and he's accused of defecting. Yeah. To the Chaldeans, and put under arrest, and and this is where the uh, uh, as was mentioned earlier, he gets put. The, he's he's beaten, and uh, he comes to the pit in the cells. Anyway, comments, Mikey. If you've been quiet for a while, I you know it's a wonderful. I don't really have anything to say about it other than <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that. Uh, First Nephi seven fourteen mentions Jeremiah being cast into prison. So we have some. Uh, you know, the, 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 those first chapters of the Book of Mormon are taking place at, right at the same time that you've got Lehi. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, Lehi and, and, and his and Nephi don't mention the Egyptians and so forth. Their, their focus is a little bit more narrow. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is right in that, that period of time when, when everything is just being turned upside down. Um, well, the, well, the interesting thing is it, it provides... Uh, I think some understanding between this and the story we went through a while ago about Uriah fleeing to Egypt and being brought back and killed, uh, you get a clearer sense of why the Lord had, probably had Nephi, or well, the Lord did have Nephi kill Laban. One of the reasons the Lord may have had for Nephi killing Laban and then taking Zoram with them, so they wanted nothing traceable to them. The, uh, the royal house was clearly capable of tracking down these prophets and arresting and killing them, mm. and in essence, uh, by virtue while, while getting the brass plates, of course, there's a big splash because they go into Laban twice, so they're clearly visible. Laban knows who they are. He knows what they want. Uh, they're probably related since Laban has the plates. It has uh, Lehi's genealogy on it, and uh, if Laban is left alive, even if they depart with the plates, uh, you know, by, by his description in the Book of Mormon, he's clearly someone with a lot of power and authority. Mm -hmm. It'd be very easy to send a party after Lehi. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you have what you have instead is sort of a, a they did they vanish without a trace. Stop and think what what's left in Jerusalem. Lehi's dead, or excuse me, Laban's dead. Plates are gone. Zorm is vanished. Yeah. There's no longer anything to connect this to Lehi and his family. Uh, and uh, it, it provides them safety in their flight out of there in, in what is a deteriorating uh, political situation and a deteriorating situation for anyone who's a prophet <laughs> because, yeah. you know, they're, they're getting killed or thrown into prison. I think that um, the one thing we see, too, here is that at least at first Egypt appears to make good on its promise, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's see, yeah. yeah. The army shows up, uh, which throws the Babylonians in a bit of disarray, right? Uh, they all know that eventually they're going to have to fight with Egypt, but uh, doing it in Palestine wasn't their first choice. Um, and then one morning, the Egyptian army leaves. They just pack up and go home, and... Uh, the Bible doesn't really give us a lot of information why, but it wouldn't surprise me if, in fact, uh, the uh, well, there was internal difficulties in Egypt that they had to return home to take care of. But uh, who knows? But what uh, the Israelites made a pact with a group in in Egypt who were really taking advantage of the situation, right, to to get the armies out so that they could uh, make their power play at home. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as part of the, the decline of Egypt and the internal struggles they were facing. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is what Jeremiah is talking about. And, um, um, but at every turn, uh, right up until that very moment, right, everything it looks like he's talking about isn't coming to pass. Uh, and this, this is prophecy comes as a great shock. It's right out of the blue. And, and by the time everybody recognizes that he's been been having good advice all this time, uh, it is absolutely too late. You know, that there's no time between that recognition and, and their and their survival. No. And and that takes us actually to where the lesson finishes up, which is 
chapters 39 and 40 that starts, you know, 39 starts with in the ninth year of King Zedekiah of Judah in the tenth month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon moved against Jerusalem with his whole army and they laid siege to it. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's a fulfillment of, of Jeremiah's prophecies and of Lehi's. Yeah. Uh, Lehi, of course, is long gone at this point. In fact, his prob may, at this point, it's, it's unclear all the chronology. They may be, they may have left Bountiful by now and be on the ocean, uh, but they're they're far, far away from this. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, thoughts on on the and commentary on the Babylonian invasion of uh, and capture of Jerusalem. Well, part of it was created by the very weakness of the king Zedekiah. He was probably put on the throne partially because he was weak. Uh, as a vassal king, they don't want to establish somebody who's really dynamic and decisive. I, I'm struck in these chapters 37 and 38 by, by the fact that... Uh, you know, he secretly invites Jeremiah and keeps wanting to know, is there a word, you know, can you tell me something? But then when Jeremiah's about, about to be arrested, uh, he says, well, you know, I, the, uh, Jeremiah's in your hand, it says in 38.5, uh, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. He's the king, but he can't, he can't really control what's going on. Um, and then you have, you have obviously different factions. You have... Um, um, in verse six, uh, he's thrown into the uh, Jeremiah is thrown into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelat, which just means the king. I don't know why the King James translators didn't translate it. It means he's the son of a king. He's a royal prince. And then there's this uh, this good guy, a servant, maybe like Zoram. Maybe there was a servant class there. Some of them who actually observed their masters and weren't altogether impressed, but were more sympathetic to the prophets. Uh, Ebed Melech, again, the word Melech, this means the servant of the king. Um, he's an Ethiopian, a eunuch, and uh, and he's sympathetic to Jeremiah. So you have all these these different factions in the city, you know, but it's the aristocrats, the hardliners, who want to do in the prophet and so on. And at, at top of all of this, you have this dithering, weak-minded, uh, indecisive king who is very ineffective and will lose his kingdom for it. Um, but kind of, but he keeps flirting with the Egyptians. He practically invites the Babylonians to come in and say, enough is enough, you're out of here. So they finally do. Does ben? anyone want to comment on uh, uh, chapter 40, verse 6? I'm sorry, 39. Sorry, excuse me, 39, verse 6. Oh, it talks about uh, his, his sons. The, son, the sons of Zedekiah are killed before his eyes. And, of course, in the Book of Mormon, we have uh, a story of the Mulekites, who yeah. are the, the descendants, supposedly, according to the story of, uh, of Mulek, son of Zedekiah. Yeah. Uh, how, do we, how do we resolve what appears to be a discrepancy in what has been actually a criticism leveled against the Book of Mormon from time to time? Well, I, I would say this, if I can have a shot at it. Mulek, first of all, is a really good name for the son of a king. Uh, it may even be a diminutive, uh, in Arabic, for example, a diminutive would be like Kitab is book and Kutaib is a pamphlet or a little booklet. Uh, so Mulek would, would be on that score a little king. is kind of a nickname. Um, I, you know, I, it seems to me that... Um, you know, if you're trying to smuggle one of your sons out to possibly lead a, a movement for the restoration of the monarchy, you're not going to allow, and, and nobody is going to want to trumpet the uh, the fact that one of the sons actually survived, you know. You want to keep that hidden for a while. Uh, don't tell people about it. Uh, there's another possibility that wasn't Scott Card, uh, I think, has written about. I've heard him say yeah. it, uh, which is simply that, you know, Maybe Mulek isn't actually the son of the king, but it was a myth that was started about him. Or maybe there wasn't even a Mulek. Uh, but the, the Mulekites are trying to gain stature when they have this alliance with the Nephites. And, well, what better thing than to align yourselves with the royal house of, of the lost kingdom that they've all come from? This gives them prestige. They don't come in at the bottom of the social ladder. They come in pretty high because we're the followers of the king uh, or the son of the, the rightful heir to the throne. Um, so we don't know. We don't know anything about Mulek except that it's claimed that he was with them when they left Jerusalem. They might have grabbed him if, if he really existed yeah. as a kind of royal trophy, you know. You grab the heir and run off with him yeah. for who knows what use in the future. 
Well, and, and this may get back to you. I, I, I would like to hear from people who actually know what they're talking about. Uh, some of the late Deuteronomy editing as to whether or not it might suit their purposes, their thematic purposes better to have Zedekiah's house wiped out completely yeah. uh, as opposed to uh, acknowledging that one of his sons might actually have, have gone away and was running around as a legitimate heir to the throne of Jerusalem while the uh, scribes are getting ready to come back or even after they have come back to rebuild Jerusalem without a monarchy. Legitimate heirs are sometimes really pesky. They're a nuisance. You don't necessarily want them around. I, I had a really odd experience when I was living in Egypt many years ago as a grad student. I was asked to teach a, a, a girl who couldn't come to campus at the American school. She needed to be tutored at home. And uh, they asked if I was interested, and I said, not particularly. And, and, uh, and they said, well, it pays really well. And I asked how much, and it was a, an enormous amount for a grad student living in Egypt. And I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm yeah. more interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my interest is growing. I said, who is this person? Well, um, her, name, her last name was Pahlavi. Um, you know, the royal name of the, of the, the of royal family of, uh, of Iran. And yeah. I said, like, the Pahlavis? And they said, yes. It was the 16-year-old yeah. daughter of the Shah. So I tutored her in the history. And at one point, we were talking about the, uh, the Russian Revolution. And she was really struck by the fact that they had massacred the entire family of the Tsar. And she wanted to know why. And I remember thinking to myself, this is probably the only person that I will ever have the occasion to talk with who has a personal stake in this question. Yeah. I said, well, the reason is, of course, they want to eliminate any possible claimant to the throne. They've got to kill them all, the kids, the parents, everybody. And she said, oh, ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> I didn't blame her for being a little bothered by it, because yeah. at that point there was still real danger to her and to, to all of the family that was left. Um, so, um, you know, but, but on the other hand, uh, uh, claiming that you have an heir is, a, is an important political thing, too. But either killing him or pretending he didn't exist, depending on your political faction, that's just as good. Yeah. Well, and it's you know it's a classic theme in literature and history. Yeah. Uh, the 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 heir to the throne who is you know spirited away and appears later uh, to claim the throne. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, he apparently you know ass assuming the story that the Mulekites told was accurate, he was spirited away a, a lot farther. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Than, than they planned, and unlike the Lehite uh, group, they they lacked the. Uh, uh, written resources to bring with them. Yeah, you know they they had they apparently had their genealogy memorized, uh, but you know they're described as being pretty ignorant at that point of the Israeli forms of worship. Yeah, uh, they did not believe in in you know Jehovah. They 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 did not seem to have a concept of the law of Moses and so on. And and as as uh, I think you've mentioned, Dan, they. they spend a fair amount of time being resentful yeah. uh, towards the, the Nephite minority that comes in and takes over power. You know, uh, that, that may say that these really are some of the uh, descendants of the aristocrats who, yeah. who never did like the message of the prophets, and they always did resent this kind of stuff. And yeah. they weren't really big on the law of Moses or all this Jehovah business. So, yeah, you let that go. We care about politics and... Uh, yeah, one other case that's a, is a famous one, a fictional, uh, more or less fictional, is uh, of trying to get the heir to the throne away is a beloved story by many, the Scarlet Pimpernel. I mean, one yeah. of the main things they're trying to get, do is get the Dauphin, the, uh, the heir to the throne of France, out. Uh, get him yeah. away. Yeah. Okay, last comments. Do we have... Uh time to talk about chapter 18. It's one of the supplementals, and it's a beautiful Go analogy. Ahead. Go for it. I'll, I'll, we're, we're, I think we're pretty much at our time limit here, so we'll, we'll go quickly. Uh, chapter 18, at the beginning, the Lord tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house, and he's going to give him a revelation there. So Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house, and he sees the potter working on the wheel, which is a, uh, it's, uh, of all the, the forms of art and craftsmanship, it's one of the most fascinating and beautiful to watch a potter take a lump of wet clay and just slowly mold it and shape it and and he says in verse 4 of chapter 18 that you know, every once in a while but something would go wrong with the pot that the potter was molding and 
so he would rework the clay, and if you've ever seen that, he would just kind of collapse it in on itself and put it back on a lump and, and, and start all over again. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah saying that, you know, Israel, can't I do with you as the potter does with the clay? Uh, and, and, he's, and he talks about how, you know, that, you know, whatever I speak of, that a, that a nation that I'm going to threaten to uproot or tear down, um, and if that nation stops doing their wrong, I'm going to cancel the destruction that I intended to do. Other times, you know, if they don't obey me, though, I'll, I'll do whatever I please with them. And it's, it's not up to you to, to be critical of me. It's up to you to just be compliant and do what I ask you to do. Um, uh, and this concept is actually found in, in a lot of places in the scriptures. It's found in Isaiah 45. Uh, it's found in 2 Nephi 27. Uh, it's found in the book of Romans. Uh, Paul discourses on it uh, quite extensively. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the, the concept of, uh, of vessels that are honor and dishonor. Um, and I just, the final thing I want to say, this is a quick quote from, from Heber C. Kimball, uh, and this is how, how it relates to us. Uh, President Kimball said, there are many vessels that are destroyed after they have been molded and shaped. Why? Because they are not contented with the shape the potter has given them, but straightway put themselves into a shape to please themselves. Therefore, they are beyond understanding what God designs, and they destroy themselves by the power of their own agency. These people have to go through a great many moldings and shapes, then have to be glazed and burned, and even in the burning, some vessels crack. <laughs> And it's a wonderful <laughs> quote on how, you know, we can fight against God and we can resist him all day long and he will continue to rework us and remold us and put us through trials and then eventually one day we're going to learn our lesson and simply be compliant and be the clay in his hands. And when that happens, then we become what he wants us to be. But before that, you know, we, we can't do anything. The, the, the clay can't resist the potter. It's a metaphor that's been really popular for a long time. He was a Kimball was fond of it and used it a lot, and it, it even shows up in uh, places like the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, uh, where God is described as the potter and we're the pots. Out of, you know, classical Persia. Ben. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Ben, ben thoughts? Summation. No, I, I think I'm set for this evening. Ben? <laughs> no, I think I'm done. You know, the, the one thing that struck me, which I've touched on, is just how many echoes there are of Jeremiah's experiences and so many of the other prophets we know uh, from the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and in modern times. And uh, he is, in some respects, the archetypical prophet uh, preaching to a, a wicked world that just won't listen to him. Uh, and there are good lessons for our day. Uh, because, you know, we're we in the last days. Uh, uh, I attended the third dedicatory session uh, of the at the Ogden Temple, and uh, Elder Oaks, in speaking, reminded us that these are the last days, that there are persecutions and destructions and travails uh, yet ahead for us as a people and, and us as a world, and we need to get our houses in order for it. So that's... That's probably the single most important lesson we need to learn as Mormons from Jeremiah is listen to the prophets because, you know, they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Any last words? If not, anyone? Going, going. Okay, we're wrapping up uh, roundtable number 91, lesson 41 for uh, Old Testament. Again, it's been uh, Daniel Peterson, Ben McGuire, Mike Parker, and I'm Bruce Webster, and we thank you for listening to us. Hope this was useful in preparing for your lessons.